Um, we're going to start by talking about best practices. We're going to do this for uh, a few minutes. This is meant to be discussion. In other words, I'm not going to be handing any best practices to you. We're going to be collecting opinions on what you believe are the best practices. So as much as possible, I'm going to try and outline the two sides of the story, and then we'll talk about it for a bit. Um, at some point on any of these, just in the interest of time and covering a few, I reserve the right to say enough discussion, we'll move on. But the idea is to actually capture the discussion and to add that to our community book of PowerShell practices. For about the last 15 minutes, though, uh, some folks have asked if we could have just a little discussion around DSC infrastructure and planning. Uh, I know Steve spent a lot of time talking about resources and config, but some folks uh, had some questions they wanted to ask around infrastructure, so we can take a stab <coughs> at that, too. Sound good? Yep. Okay. So. Um, very briefly, we're going to be talking uh, about some different practices and things we can do. Every single thing that is called a best practice has upsides and downsides. There is almost no time or no practice you can point to that is always the correct thing to do. Even nicely formatting your code takes extra time, right? So you can only say, if I'm in a super, super hurry and I just have to knock this out instantaneously because my entire company is going to go out of business if I don't do it, Formatting is obviously less of a priority then. Now, you might circle back later and fix the when you've got more time to spend, but there's ups and downs to these. Not if you have bias steroids. <laughs> <laughs> it's a walking billboard. <laughs> so the idea here is to sort of capture some of the when you do and when you don't. Because what we're trying to do is help people understand, yes, this is the best practice, but if there is a downside to it, then at least understand when that is so that you're not blindly doing something that might be hurting you on some occasion. Uh, so the first one we're going to start with is this one. Now, this has become a discussion in the forums on, on PowerShell.org quite a bit, which is if you're going to share a script with someone, you should sign it so that they know the script came from you and they know that whatever's in their hands, whether it's incompetent, malicious, or otherwise, is as you intended. But there's a downside to signing a script, which is that you've got to go get a code signing certificate. And if it's a script you plan to share with the public, the code signing certificate kind of needs to be a public one too, because if they don't trust the person who issued the certificate, you might as well have not wasted your time. So the downside to signing everything that you share out with the public is there's an expense associated with it. You've got to buy the certificate. And code signing certs are among the more expensive ones. And they're typically only issued to organizations, not to individuals, which if you're just doing this on your own could become problematic. So there's downsides too. So what's your take? How many of you have ever gone up and stolen, sorry, repurposed something from the internet? <laughs> Was it signed? How did that make you feel? Terrible. <laughs> Uh, you should understand your code anyway. Yeah, that's a good point. So because this is going to lead into another discussion point, though, do you think there, there is or should be different levels of trust across different sources? For example, if you were to go up to an official Microsoft.com website and download a hunk of code, do you have a different expectation for that? Would you expect it to be signed? What if it was a Microsoft.com website where people were submitting code and Microsoft was hosting it? Nope. No level of trust in, intrinsic. Okay. What other, are there other levels? So basically, Microsoft should shine their code, everybody else gets off scot free. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my take on it is that uh, you shouldn't really take code, whether it comes from Microsoft or not. Uh, basically, I'll just run it. So just you, you, have, to you have to understand your code, even if even if Microsoft wrote it. Yeah, in that, that context, it doesn't really matter whether it's signed or because it's open text. Sure. From yeah. Either it's you can, different, but it's open source essentially. You yeah. can read it. You can test it. Yeah. And if you don't understand it, don't run it. And if you don't understand it, don't run it. We should, we should have a banner at the top of our forums that says that. <laughs> everyone, everyone downloads executables. Well, we yeah, do download we executables, don't, don't but, exe them. but executables are a lot more commonly signed. You might not realize it, but it is a lot more common for them to be signed than scripts. 
Microsoft does sign most of their executables, as do most larger vendors. Even if your even a script that you download is signed, then it you can still screw up your machine. Yeah, signature is no guarantee of usefulness or yeah, so the only reason that uh, it's less likely that a deliberately malicious script would be signed because you could track them down and kill them. But it doesn't mean an incompetent script, you know, someone who meant the best thing in the world, or maybe it worked great on their system, but your system has something other going with it and it breaks everything there. Yeah, so yeah, yeah, a script does not mean trustworthiness, it means identification. I also heard once from Jeff, he made a script for a customer and the customer changed some stuff, and then they blamed him. The well, customer changed some stuff, and it was his yeah. fault. Well, but they, but they broke the signature. Yeah, th that's uh, that could be a reason to there use the signature. signature back then. There was no what? Signature. <laughs> well, you didn't use signatures, Bob. Okay. So yeah. Okay. So what this sort of leads into is something that um, Dan Harmon was discussing, I think, on Monday, which is remember he he had to talk about one get <coughs> and PS get. And the idea behind PSGET is that it's this public repository of modules. So instead of you having to fly up to 50 different GitHub repos and figure out where modules are, this is a place where the community can load all these things. And one of the things he said they were still trying to figure out is what the submission criteria would be. Right now, for example, they require a title and a description on something. So there's some metadata. What other sorts of things and Digital signature is another thing that we could think about. What other sorts of things would you want to be in a PowerShell gallery submission? Description's nice, title is nice. Also, I, I wouldn't trust the download. I would want to say he did Notepad++. I want to download Notepad++ myself. So you'd want to download it and look at it first? Yeah, but use it with, uh, and then um, apply whatever one get does to that, the switches, or et cetera. But I wanted to use my executables. And so to be fair, we're not talking executables. PowerShell gallery, this is strictly PowerShell gallery, so we'll set some, some rules around this. This is all script code, right? These are people's, so you're going to be able to read it. It's installing it, but that's just a file copy, essentially. You're going to be able to go look at it before you run it. Sure, but one get is downloading the executables. So we're, we're more specifically on PS get. Okay, okay. That's this discussion. Um, I would like to have some feedback mechanism where you can, when you download a script, submit whether it's malicious, whether it's working, whether it's good or bad, and then just don't okay. trust the crowd. So, so some feedback, thumbs up, thumb down, like, dislike, it, it, rating, not, not just like, dislike, like star also, rating, also, but some text also. Some blocking, like if you if you see something dangerous in it, you should be able to block it. All right, so if something's bad, you should be able to report as evil. Yes. Okay. Some sort of versioning information. This versioning information. Require version five. Don't even accept it into the gallery unless there's a version number. Something that binds the, the script to the author, it doesn't have to be signing, but let's say that Tobias produces some script that I like, and I set up my machine to download that script. I want to be sure that the thing that I'm downloading is the thing that I reviewed two weeks ago, not so something that you posted. So that's, a, that's essentially what a di digital signature is gonna do. In, in other <laughs> words, to give us any way of making sure that what I downloaded was in fact the thing I thought I downloaded, we either use digital signatures or we reinvent the digital signature. Yeah, yeah this is, uh, you can do it uh, somewhere in between. Like if you're a registered user uh, at our, our repository, and then you say, oh, well, show me all the scripts from this registered user. I mean, indeed, I might register myself as this Don Joan when you have. I mean, <laughs> So something a little in between, just identifying the author. Maybe something in between when we've got some people, like say the PowerShell community, uh, we know who's logged in and they have a signature. And if, let's say, Don Jones um, reviewed that package, then we can trust it. So a different level of trust, when you get it, you can say, just allow Don Jones to be trusted. Okay, so, so it's also something about who's reviewed the thing and who's maybe looked at it and, and thumbs up it. Expression is by far the most dangerous thing you can do. Uh, so I'd love to know, just kind of heads up. 
just some basic scanning of the content to maybe flag some dangerous behaviors. Uh, I would like to be uh, for the admission of the uh, script as well. Like it to be well documented. I mean, of course, you don't have to see what a get item does or what no good get item does. But if you have certain scripts and loops and, and, and uh, just a little explanation, what you're doing where in a script. So some level of commenting or maybe at yeah, least well at least the need for comment-based help maybe. Yeah. yeah. Okay. On testing, probably. It would be interesting to have the test like as, as we discussed earlier in the, the summit. So if it had been tested, then perhaps publish the test results? Could be, yeah, well written but not well documented. Yeah, so I mean it might be four stars for what it's doing and one star for what it's doing. So a little bit more than just, yeah, maybe several rating categories for something. Yeah, okay. I, don't know. I mean, that might just make it too bumpkin. People might say the heck with it. But. You never know. We're just kind of talking about it right now, so. I definitely think anyone that publishes anything should have an account, should be registered. So right, so in order to publish something, you have to have an account. Yeah, or to comment. Okay. So like a Microsoft.NotMyLivePassport ID, or whatever we call it now. And then, and then the, also <laughs> the commenting or the, the, the ratings, is just to, to keep out all the, the false information. Okay. But you should have allowed anonymous access, so people can learn if they just... Sure, sure anonymous downloads, sure. We're talking okay. submitting. Yeah. All the way back. No? Oh, um... <clears throat> Uh, no write host inside a script. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I'm only going to argue with you a little bit about the no write host because there is legitimate times to use it, which is when you're creating something that's intended for human interaction. And there's a verb in PowerShell show, which tells us that a command show dash command, for example, tells us it's for human interaction. So I might use that to do some little menu script for my tech desk. So we wouldn't just arbitrarily exclude that. Those people are still probably going to go to hell, but that's on that. <laughs> We can't police the world's soul. Okay, so, something I do when I download scripts as a first pass is I just check all the verbs. So if it's a reporting script, why is there a set in there, for example? So having a okay, quick, so kind of like almost what a module does, right? So 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 a little bit more scanning on behaviors, for example. Yeah. Okay, I got you. Okay, one more. Yeah, uh, just want to point out uh, a possible negative in, in, in having a rating uh, on the script. Uh, there's we talked about the, the positives, of course, but. There might be for, for new users, uh, so there might be two users that have similar kind of scripts, and, and people will use the highest rating one, uh, even though a lower rating one might be better, and it also might also discourage new users for actually submitting stuff. Sure, there are downsides to ratings. I, I think that's probably across all systems that involve ratings, including <laughs> Yelp. Um, that's that's probably tough to fight with. So a mechanism for removing dubious ratings. Well, because you know you got people who don't understand how the things I, work. I, I'll tell you something are. else. You have to be careful of. You have to be careful of predicting problems that haven't yet existed and then building an entire bureaucracy to prevent those problems from existing. Because um, I, I don't know what, what the budget is on this, but I'm pretty sure it probably doesn't include a whole moderation pass. And you know, the more, the more overhead you add to this, the less useful it becomes to everybody. Um, some IP cleanliness, so some sort of clear copyright policy and licensing policy. Licensing. In other words, before you submit something, Maybe there's a drop down of several licenses and you have to indicate how you're going to license this to people. That's good. Or, or it could simply be everything put into here is this license and if you don't like that, go somewhere else. Yeah, that'd be okay too. An alternative to, to rating system should be like, um, <coughs> well, if I approve the script or like say that I like this script, then someone could use like me as a reference, like a vouching uh, mechanism. So almost a little point-based thing like Stack Exchange uses maybe. So maybe. You know, if, if a highly rated user has thumbsed up you, then that, that helps you surface a little bit more. Yeah, or maybe I can... Almost a reputation who, score. Who I want to trust or who I... Sure. I have, who's vouching I approve of. Sure. So I can have like my 50 persons... Uh, One more and then we'll move on. What intelligent category? Maybe maybe tagging instead of categories. <coughs> yeah, I think it, it would be possible to um, create a new version of the skip by somebody else. So if you make a skip and I think about an improvement, that I can. So you can upload a new version of the same thing and it categorize to you, but that way it, it yeah. 
Yeah, link them maybe. There's a newer version of this by someone else. OK. All right, I'm going to hold it off on those. Um, that This is a, a kind of a, a big deal in terms of you know Microsoft hosting a code repository. Uh, that's something that the company has often struggled with in the past. So it's something I'm sure they're going to be spending a lot of time on. But Dan, something else, if you decide you want to get a bigger collection of feedback on this sort of thing, let me know and we'll do it through PowerShell.org and we can put up some surveys and things and, and help you get a larger body of feedback too. Yeah, well, this is, this is a great comment. So I'm on all these That's very stock Microsoft phrase. I'll take that feedback. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, next thing. Where do you store your modules? Where should we be telling people to store modules? Now, in PowerShell 4, the program files location became a default. So that almost seems perfect because it's a location everybody can use. In the past, we were kind of limited by default to just my documents, which was just you, or System32, which is supposed to be just Microsoft. Um, and then, of course, you have always have the ability to extend that PS module path variable, environment variable, to pick other locations. What would you tell folks is the, the best place to store their modules? Whatever's in the module path. Whatever, so something in the module path. <clears throat> I'm thinking something system-wide, although if people have a certain standard for I place my custom scripts here. Yeah, if, you, if, you've, if you've come up with your own standard, you've thought about it. This, this would be guidance to someone who hadn't thought that far about it yet. Maybe. So system-wide. Yeah, system-wide. System system yeah, I think we're missing a part where, where I can put private modules, but they are guaranteed to be local. So if I have a roaming profile, I put stuff in a roaming profile. Oh, for, so yeah, roaming, roaming profiles are, yeah, that creates complications. So yeah, that oh, those are tacit assumptions. Hang on, hang on. I was saying in an enterprise environment, you would store your modules enterprise-wide because you want the same modules on all your servers, right? You, you may. I don't know that you do. You might. Someone else might not. Like kind of depends. Different environments are probably going to have different ideas about enterprise-wide. But I mean, in general, if, if someone's just going and downloading a few things for their own use, you would say put it in documents because it's yours. OK. All right. So there's probably a couple ups and downs there, too. Right. I think there's an upside to putting it in documents if it's something that I'm still playing with because it keeps it a little bit private to me. It's not going to pop up automatically for somebody else at least. And then if it's something that's going to be a little bit more production-y and I've got several people using the folks, program files makes more sense. Yeah. Well, my documents kind of sucks if you've got um, folder redirection. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what we are just talking about. With roaming profiles and folder redirection, it gets to be problematic. Now, have any of you used group policy to manage PS module path and add a a common shared location for modules. Who's who's done that? I tried it, but failed. Yeah. You failed. Uh, if there are some um, uh, PLLs or assemblies or stuff you load with your modules, you will get some all sorts of .NET security issue related stuff. So you had some problems. Yeah. yeah you got to trust the whole. Does that yeah. go away after PowerShell three? Was that like a thing with the previous version of the framework? No. We, we scripted it for some solutions for some service, like the problem with doing the GAC security stuff that allowed that and added it to trust yeah. locations and all that stuff. So there's a whole bunch of different Yeah, it's it's that. harder than just modifying that if you're calling on other .NET framework assemblies and things like that. Yeah. OK. Just curious. Uh, one, one problem is with working with so a different version of modules in one path. That's different so versions of modules in one path. Yeah, they have the same names. They, there's not really a resolution for that, think, uh, other than don't do that. I think the thing here is to is to make sure that you're not making assumptions about someone else's environment, because uh, you know, there are many, many ways that people organize file systems and folders. Well, yeah, there are many ways. And I think if you, if you say, OK, my profile is in C backslash users backslash thing, and you assume that's correct, but when it isn't correct, you know, your, your solution isn't going to work. So, well, and, yeah. and so so one thing that, that this, the one, of the, one of the reasons I wanted to make this a discussion is for exactly that. There are problems with some locations. There are problems just randomly adding things to PS module path, and you shouldn't make assumptions about someone's environment. So that's the type of guidance we want to offer to people. You know, understand these are defaults. There are some downsides to different ones. Here's what they are so that someone can go about making an informed decision. If, you, if you're thinking about centralizing it, 
do a similar structure to the group policy administrative templates. You have a centralized store on Syscall. And for those scripts that you think should be company-wide, should be used anywhere, maybe DC or whatever, you can place them there. So you can have a central store, yeah. Should and and that's what we were talking about with, with modifying PS module path to make sure PowerShell knows where that is. OK. Uh, this is something that comes up a lot in folks' classes. I, I spend a lot of time talking to different trainers. I spend a lot of time answering questions and reading questions on the forums. And I tried to, to boil the overall issue down a little bit for this. So this is kind of a understand an oversimplification of the issue. But in general, what it is, you'll see folks sometimes write a function that accepts a computer name maybe multiple computer names, and it's going to run some process against all those computer names. And they will create a second parameter set that instead accepts a file path. And maybe they've coded it so that that file path is a plain text file, or maybe it's a CSV file. Sometimes they'll have a third parameter set which accepts the name of an Active Directory organizational unit. So this function is going out and getting the computer names out of a file, or getting the computer names out of an OU, which means it's it's doing several things as opposed to, to take a different approach, running one command to get the computer names, whatever that might be, sticking them in the pipeline, and then piping them to whatever it is that's going to do those. Now, I will typically, in classes, preach that you want that separation. What are your thoughts? Who prefers to have them separated like that? OK. Well, then we'll keep preaching that. <laughs> Snover's shaking his head. He doesn't like it. Are you just being grunk, cranky, or? Oh, excuse you. Oh. Why reinvent the wheel? Shh, 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 hang on. So often, sometimes these commandlets will use RPC or DCOM or whatever, and you might not have PowerShell coding on some down level system. So that's when it's great. OK. In fact, in, in, fact, in workflow, when you create the commandlets, there's a, a property there, what we call it, remoting capability. You declare whether or not the command does its own remoting, and then in workflow, we will delegate the remoting capabilities to the command so it's more efficient. So by and large, separation of duty is good, but there are probably some situations where a command might do more than one thing to accommodate situations. Yeah, I mean, if you have a uniform you know, PowerShell uh, uh, you know, implemented everywhere, <coughs> that's great. But you know, I, I always like to say the world always has been, always it is, and always will be a messy place. You're going to have situations where you can't do this, you can't do that. You know, options are your options are an admin's friend. But by and large, I don't think I don't think it's a great idea to over-engineer something that's been already done for you, right? Like if there's already a get content, use that. The get content that, that already exists isn't good enough for you. Create a new one and create whatever script and combine them in a third function. So. Yeah, if you, if you have to write some other tool, yeah, so that's kind of what this last piece is. If you've, one of the reasons folks will often go down this path of building everything into one function is because they just don't want to have to type command A, pipe command B, pipe command C. And that's fine. Write a script that combines those things together so long as those things are still sort of discrete. Even if they live in that same script, they can still be a little discrete. So don't, real quick, don't read computer name. That was just an example on this. This isn't a remoting discussion. <laughs> this, this was, I've created something that is both reading things and doing things all in one chunk, as opposed to breaking those into more composable units. Yeah, so don't over invent. And be aware of what's happening. Dan? You know, the, other, the other aspect is, you know, you want to think about how general purpose is the thing <laughs> you're writing. If it's really general purpose and it takes a lot of inputs, then, yeah, you don't want to have stuff separated out. But there might be times when you're just writing a script that's really hard coded to do uh, really specific things, more like an application. 
Yeah, if something's really, really, really specific and tied to a business process, then it's probably not a tool so much as it is a, a what I in classes call a controller to distinguish the two. One more, one more comment. Um, we, um, I'm working for a company where we are trying to provide product via a bunch of commandlets, and a lot of the UX feedback we've had with actual customers is that when our scripts to get some work done are composed of lots and lots of commandlets, it just scares the customers off. And we so that scripts that are running a bunch of commands scares yeah, people. Yeah, so for the past three days, most of the scripts that I've seen on the, board, on, the, uh, on the screen here would have scared most of the customers that I've spoken to. Yeah, I don't and think you can prevent people from being scared other than education. Okay, but we, but we have to be aware that the very fact that the people in this room are in this room means that they are not the kind of customer who is just moving towards using PowerShell because they're and, being pushed And, that and I think there might be a difference, too, in the practices you adopt when you're providing a commercial product versus the practices you adopt when you're building something for your own team. Okay. That was all good feedback. Uh, next, module manifests. There was a, an interesting discussion on this, and I kind of wanted to get some feedback in a discussion more live, back and forthy. And it was, a lot of folks will build a script module with just a PSM1 file, and let's say they do a great job of putting documentation and everything, and they'll ship it out there, but they won't ship a manifest with it. And another side of that argument said, you should always ship a manifest because there's some valuable metadata that only lives in the manifest. And even if the only thing the manifest is doing is loading that script file, that metadata is useful. It's a, it's a structured place to put your name and a copyright and a version. That's one of the things that really came out in the discussion. So understanding that there's different situations and internally, on a really quick project, you might pump out a script module and you might not do the manifest. But do you think that in a perfect world, you should always have a manifest, even if it's just loading one file? Who would say yes? That's a lot. Who says no? You don't bother with that. It's a waste of 15 so bytes of disk space. Does auto discovery also rely on the manifest? So. Auto discovery doesn't rely on manifest. It can discover what's in a script module with no manifest, if it's in the right spot. Okay, so let me, let me say that for everybody so it's on the tape too. One of the things you can do in a manifest is list the commands that your module provides that it exports. If you do that in the manifest versus just letting it implicitly export everything or versus running export module member inside the script module, if you do all that in the manifest, it's easier for PowerShell to quickly find out what commands you offer as opposed to it having to parse the entire module and find those. And just to be clear, don't use wildcards in that case. And don't use wildcards <laughs> or we'll have to go look anyway, yeah. yeah. One question about this, is this a performance game every time or isn't there a cache? Yeah. There's a cache, right? So it would be only for the first call that you had the benefit for that version. Okay. So basically though, we like manifests is what I'm hearing. Yeah, yeah. Okay. <coughs> Uh, the cache is per user and then as long as it's needed. I don't think we need to dive too far into that, but once you run the auto analysis, it is cached until the module changes for each user. Well, it's got logged off log back in. The cache is still there or not? It's still there. Okay. But what it does make a big difference, if, you've, if you extend this out 10 years in the future and you've got you know, 50, 100 modules in your PS module path, and all these people have made the decision to let you analyze their scripts. The first time you you know set up a new machine or get to use it, it's going to take a while to dig through. So it is a good practice to put exported commands. Snover's machine already looks like that. Of course, you also get versioning in manifest stuff. You get versioning. You get some other metadata. That's very nice to have too. Yeah. I think it's also important in the manifest. You can also define dependencies maybe on other modules. You can define nested modules and things like that. Yeah, that's additional metadata that can be defined. OK, so there's a lot of upsides and not many down ones. Uh, this is an argument, and I mean argument, that comes up a great deal. Now, I have, I, so here's the basic argument, and then let me tell you what we're not going to talk about. The basic argument is, if I can't do it with a PowerShell commandlet, 
then I mustn't do it at all. Right? That's one side of the argument. The other side of the argument is, screw it, I'm going to use whatever's out there. Uh, if it's a .NET class that gets the job done, I'll do that. If it's a, if it's a command line executable, I'll do that. And then there's kind of a middle ground, which is if you can do it with a native PowerShell command and that gets your job done, do it that way and spend a minute looking to see if you can. For example, folks who will build ping into their scripts instead of using test connection and they'll write, write a lot of code to parse the output of ping when they could have just run test connection, which essentially does that job for them. And as you need tasks that aren't solved by a native command, you can devolve to the .NET framework by preference and then devolve to external command line utilities, which get relatively less discoverable and less consistent as you sort of go down that chain. So the specific area of argument that it kind of now comes up is this. Let's say I have a scenario where I need to get a job done. There's nothing native in PowerShell that does it. I'm going to use some external executable, which has got some wacky inconsistent syntax. One side of the argument says, you should spend the time to write a PowerShell command, advanced function, around that. So you can provide comment-based help and discoverability, and you can, you can make that external thing more consistent with what's in the shell before you use it. The other side of that argument, essentially what I've seen is, I don't want it. <laughs> it, it takes time, right? You're, you're definitely adding more, more of your own development time and your own test time because you've got to now wrap this thing together and then test your various scenarios and make sure it all works and everything. And there are folks who just say, you know what, the, the investment does not get me any return. There's no right answer here. I'm just kind of interested in what you think. We're talking about best practices. Well, best does not mean the one true only way. This isn't a religion. This is something that has to get applied to production and there are pros and cons. Doing it one way certainly gets you a lot of benefits, but it takes a lot of time, and sometimes you don't have the time. So just what are your feelings? How do you feel? <laughs> Conflicted is good. I, I, always, I always think about the reusability. Reusability. Yeah, because you might think that you will never need it again. You will always need it again. Yeah. So, so I always wrap it. Function. You always try to create a wrapper, okay? Yeah, same experience here. Like when you you get the freedom, you have the freedom to cross cross the border and go to low level, but then civilize it by wrapping it, and you will see it all over the place in your show commands. Oh, I like that word. I'm going to use that word. Civilize it. Yeah. <laughs> I love that word. <laughs> but then, then you it'll be offered to you whenever you look for it next month. Right. It'll be there. It'll be documented. It'll be discoverable. I think, I think a downside to wrapping stuff, it's great if you're guaranteed that your wrapped environment is available to you, but if you're moving around a lot from system to system, you may not have that wrapper. If you're writing a wrapper, you have to find a way to take it with you, which sometimes might not be possible. So uh, I tend to avoid them. So you avoid them for that reason, okay? Yeah, it depends who you're making it for or who will be using it. Uh, Certainly. I try to use mostly PowerShell, the, the native commands. But yeah, if you have big environments for performance reasons, yeah, then you look for for solutions to make it performant. And if you're using something that's native in the OS, your wrapper isn't native, and so then you have to worry about, is my wrapper there when I run this? Okay, that's legit. Why don't you come into a company, what would you like to find if the previous administrator just had all these complex things without wrappers or anything? Would you prefer that, or would you rather come in and have it all documented? <laughs> He's making this argument that we should be nice to other people, and I don't buy it. <laughs> no, I mean, we, can, we can sit here and say, well, uh, this works better, and it's less well, investment. So, and so the, the guidance... Like you come into another company where someone thought that, and you irritate, you're irritated. So the, the guidance then is perhaps ideally wrap it, but understand that you then have these other things you have to worry about. Is the wrapper going to be a bit available because those are the downsides. So again, we're not trying to say there's one true way. We're trying to say this is what everyone would love to see. You know, even you would love to see the wrapper around everything. It's just not always practical in your environment. So here's the potential caveats. It depends about the process. Usually you start with trying playing with something, you try to get the job done, and then you need to at some point come back and then civilize it again. But it's not one process. I need this to, you, to do my right. job. Play with it first, get it working, and then come back and dress it up later. Okay, I'm going to take one more. Yeah, I think 
also depends on the complexity of the tool you're using. I mean, for a small tool with a couple of inputs and a couple of outputs, you can easily write a wrapper. Sure, complexity. Write a wrapper around net, right? But if you try it with Robocop, for example, that would be one heck of a wrapper. Yeah, I was thinking like the net use, net help, net all that would be yeah, that really would be easy. But sometimes you use tools who are meant for that job. Sure. I, yeah, you can try and do yeah, so sometimes the complexity means you would be starting your own development company yeah, to write a wrapper yeah, around this. Bit of a trade off on what use would it be to, to write a wrapper around it. Now, just as a quickie, you know when you you find that tool that's way too complex to write your own wrapper around, you go on Connect and you suggest that the PowerShell team do it, right? <laughs> yeah, or, or when the tool is good, why try to do something with Why try and reinvent it if the tool works well? I think it's always useful to bear in mind that we all have two jobs. One job is to get the thing, the task we have done. Job one, get the thing done. And then the second is to get it done in a way that it, you know maximizes our lifelong earnings. And often if you just like hack and whack and get something done, we get that job done, but you haven't built yourself any tools to help you the next you're not a good person. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> by, building, by building these tools, then all of a sudden, you know, you have tool chefs, and the next time something comes up around, you can do it faster and build another tool. And then you can share that tool and gain a reputation for being a tool builder, and you get all the bonuses, and people who use your tools don't. So. <laughs> all right. Um, that was kind of most of the practices I, I, I really wanted to run through. Those were kind of some high priority ones that have come up in the community a lot. So folks wanted to talk a little bit about DSC infrastructure and planning. I know we had a little ad hoc discussion about um, how do I get GUIDs out to machines before, so I can get them into pull mode. And I, some folks asked if we could just take 10, 15 minutes for some open Q&A or discussion. Um, I've got about nine or 10 clients who are actively using DSC either in production or in, in just pre-production. So if there's some questions about what have you seen people succeed at and fail at, I can definitely answer the fail at part. <laughs> <laughs> well, what would be the downside to use it for workstations? The downside for workstations. Um, so that question usually is something that customers will pose as a, why would I use DSC instead of group policy? And they're actually different questions. Group policy has got very rich targeting. And the downside about DSC compared to that is you have to decide in advance what config you're going to push out. There's no client side intelligence that's going to make decisions and do this on Tuesdays or that if you're hooked up to the network or that if you're in the Seattle office instead of Chicago. So because clients move around a lot, DSC is a little bit harder sometimes. But that's not to say I, I have two clients that are managing certain things across large bases of clients. Um, I've got one that's using, a, using DSC to, to manage some kiosk machines, which are a lot more static, obviously. Um, and another that's using it for a lot of different client categories that tend to be a little bit more static. And they're not managing a lot right now. So they're, they've kind of scoped themselves into what they can do. Um, that's one of the biggest differences, though, is that there's a lot of intelligence in the group policy client, call it, whereas the LCM is less about intelligence and less about a, a static list of things, because servers don't tend to move around and change as much. We kind of like them to stay very much the same, which is what the technology is for. Uh, I can add some stuff to that because we use DSC on, on all our workstations. Um, <clears throat> so some things you have to be careful of is when you're using file resource, um, is that when you're doing like comparisons, uh, it basically goes on and, and hashes or checks the last modified data of all of the files that you're comparing it in that directory if you've got match. Um, and so if you are over a slow connection, it's got to then, if it's doing the, the hashing, it's got to pull down all of those files to do a compare, which if you've got a 512k connection shared between 80 people, um, can take a while. Yeah, long downside. <laughs> yeah, and so as a broader thing on that, it's really important to understand that that DSC, like everything else in computers, isn't magic, and to understand what it's doing. How, how many of you remember the first time you went to an environment, probably back in the NT4 days, and everybody just decided to turn on roaming profiles? And then you said, holy crap, why is all that stuff on all my users' desktops? Because their desktops are just filled with access databases. 
right? And so the first time everybody logged in afterwards, login took three hours while it drug all that stuff down from the file server. So you, with all of this stuff, you've got to understand what it's doing so that you know if it's going to be appropriate for whatever situation. And the good news is most of the resources, file being a notable exception, are scripts. So you can open it up and see what they're doing. File's a big DLL, so it's a little bit more magical. But what else? Yeah, we are thinking of using it in our uh, test except production environment. I'm going to trick you we are kind of wrestling about a bit is how you're going to uh, structure it. Because you say you can uh, separate the what from the make it so uh, uh, phase. But then again, if I run the configuration, I don't want to ruin the configuration. Com configuration, I'm already using in production. So that kind of like makes me want to split. So, so I'll tell you, I've got one customer that's doing exactly that. They've got a, a dev, a verification, and production, and they've got a different pull server for each one. Yeah. Now, they're all on the same virtual <laughs> machine. They've just set up different websites, and they've written a PowerShell script that once something is ready to go on to the next phase, they run it. It copies the config over to the next environment, copies the resources over to the next environment. It's, direct, it's just a file copy, yeah. and then they can start playing with it in that environment. We're uh, trying to sort of, we are trying to do the same itself. We use Team City as a as a build server. And we're trying to make some PowerShell scripts, but it does exactly the same thing. Once you check it in in dev, it will be deployed in the dev structure. Right. If it's merged, then it will go to the. And and that's what this company's done, and they've been reasonably successful. They're managing configs with about 300, 400 settings in the configs. I mean, they're they're good size, uh, and they're reasonably complex. They're using them to build out largely application servers. Yeah. And yeah, normally I run into companies that keep those you know, really separated. So, so I wouldn't expect them to be combined. I'm not sure what your experience is. Yeah, no, they're relatively well. So, you mean separated in terms of. Yeah, really separated. No network connection between. Oh, uh, I don't have any customers that are doing that. I run into that a lot, though. I, there's definitely folks who we keep all the pr dev stuff over in this VM farm, and there's an air gap between that and production. Yeah, that happens. You just have to work out what your process is going to be for getting things to one place or another. That, that same company keeps all their configs in source control too, which is a great idea. It's a script. You're all using source control, right? Didn't we talk about this Monday? Yes. Okay. Um, so, and that's part of it. Uh, source control is part of how they move from one environment to another. Uh, yeah, the, the company I work for, we, uh, we use regular uh, uh, GPOs and SSEM. Uh, so how would I sell in uh, using starting to use DSC? Uh, what um, the added benefit? If you're, all right, so versus GPO versus, you're talking SCCM's audit capability? Yeah, all right. for config, deployment, yeah, yeah. everything. Uh, on you. Um, the biggest difference between DSC and what we've had before, the biggest advantage, there are differences also, but the biggest advantage is that it's way easier to extend. You can already, what are we, seven waves in now of the resource kit? You can configure infinitely more things with DSC than you could with group policy. And it's much, much easier to get those extensions built because they're scripts. And it's easier to get them deployed in a pull environment because the client will do it for you. Extending the group policy client is hard. It's, it's C++ programming by and large. And deploying those extensions is hard. The SCCM bit is not really extensible except for the script bit, uh, and that is what it is. Um, there's downsides, right? DSC doesn't isn't a, a plug-in replacement for group policy. So the upside, though, at least in a server workload, is you can do a lot more with it, a lot, lot more. I find it a little bit easier to look at a script that is essentially human readable. So that's the configuration than it is to go wandering through a bazillion nested checkboxes and tree views, which is a group policy. I don't find it easy to read the ADMX files and all that stuff. <laughs> so I, I, think, I think another advantage of DSC is it's just easier for a human brain to look at the whole thing. There's also no resultant set of policy. But would, would it make sense to, to actually use both? Because we use uh, System Center uh, for deploy security patches. So, so we would always have that. Asking if it makes sense to do both depends a lot more on your political, how you like to run your environment than the technology. They work differently. You know, right now, System Center's got, it's, I won't call it a great GUI, but it's got a GUI on top of all that clicky, configure stuff. DSC 
done. There's no tooling on top of it. It's a good platform that's growing, but there's not that top level wrap around pretty tools that make it a little easier to use. So in a large environment, I mean, what I see a lot of customers struggling with is we've got 3,000 computers, we've got 2,000 different configs. We're having a tough time keeping track of which WID goes with which machine, no tool. So that's potentially a downside, it, but it, it, it's so specific to your environment that Yeah, there's no built-in intelligence for them coordinating with each other. They'll just constantly <laughs> step on each other and create chaos. It has also reminded me the thing before, that they said that it would be possible to combine uh, multiple configurations. I think that's also when you, for example, split responsibilities with uh, SQL team. Uh, yeah, so, team. and that's what partial configs will, will help enable, is the ability to say, you are allowed to own these bits of config, I am going to own these bits of config, and the technology can help us not step each other within the bounds of DSC. It's not gonna stop the idiot who's pushing out group policy that's stepping on all of us. One more and then we're gonna get your time. Yeah. And also on uh, SCCM, your software will be delivered somewhere along the way in the weekend. I mean, that's, that's nice for big office corporations, which are enterprises. Well, when you log in tomorrow, you will have your software. You want a continuous deployment and, and a delivery system. You need to have the software now when I'm deploying it. So design state configuration makes a lot more sense. In a, in a DSC is a little more deterministic. It's, yeah, it's, it it's more in an in enterprise like that. When you're I, I, software continuous. I, I will say this, the majority of my customers who are making the DSC versus SCCM decision, leaving group policy out of it for a moment, because I don't have a lot that are using that on server level, and that's where, my, that's where my experience has been. So the ones who are talking SCCM versus DSC have very clearly seen DSC as the technology that goes forward, and their general analysis of the situation is that the SCCM configuration auditing is probably at a dead end or near a dead end, and so they don't want to invest any further in that approach. Group policy is a whole separate set of questions, but so far my customers have kind of looked at the overall situation and thought, one of these is going to keep going and it's probably going to be DSC because it's clearly under more development. I mean, in less than a year, it can already do way more than SCCM has been able to do in 12. So, all right, I'm gonna wrap it up there. Um, thanks guys, and we'll take a quick break and we'll bring uh, Jeffrey up to wrap us up. Um, again, thank you so much for attending. Uh, keep an eye on us. We're going to try and do this again. Uh, Chris is out there. He's been calling a couple of hotels already and, and venues to try and nail stuff down. So hopefully that'll happen quick. Um, again, thanks for being here and uh, have a good trip home.